Okay, Be'ezat Hashem, Na'ase V'Natzliach. I want to welcome you to another session of our Parashat HaShavua, learning here at Tzadar Ezzah. Baruch Hashem, we are up to Parashat Miketz. Today's lesson is going to be about Yosef HaTzadik and his connection to Hanukkah. Very, very interesting lesson. We're going to go deep into some of the Midrashim, but this is something that we've been driving at for the past few weeks. But this week, Baruch Hashem is going to uh, go in a different direction and we'll see uh, a, a very interesting lesson that connects the holiday to this week's parasha, which is always something interesting how everything lines up. Be'ezat Hashem did the following, uh, the following lesson be to the Yeru Nishmat of Avraham Yoshua ben Sultana, David ben Zohara, Yaniv ben Rina, Michel ben Zohara, Aviv ben Vivi, and should be to the general success of Abraham ben, Di, ben Daniel, Yaakov ben Daniel, Gai ben Dina, uh, Stacy Esther Batester, our good friends, uh, Hedgy Gordetsky and family, uh, Pesi and Dov, Bechim Abayim, we back, and also to this lesson is dedicated to the Mendel family, to the Lankry family, and to our good new friend Yudit that joins us exactly in Hanukkah, which Yudit is one of the uh, uh, key players in the story of this Chag. Shashem Barechotchem, Samechotchem, you should have health, wealth, uh, spiritual success, but how about Sachem when you do? And Be'ezat Hashem, this gives a lot of Nachatuach to Kadosh Baruch Hu that on Hanukkah we're increasing our Torah learning. Okay, a basic lesson that we've learned in many, many classes before. We'll repeat it in order to set the foundation of the lesson and then we'll move forward. Sefer Bereshit is called, uh, is famously known to be Ma'ase Avot Siman Lebanim. That the, the patriarchs paved the way for their children. Every single story that's in Sefer Bereshit is like a spiritual GPS for their children to come just like we and by the way we know that the, the acronym the Rashid Tevot of Mase Avot Siman Lebanim is the same letters of Samech Mem and Aleph Lamed which is the name of the Yetzirah his angelic name in other words how do you defeat the devil <laughs> Mase Avot Siman Lebanim follow the ways of the patriarchs and they'll show you how to beat them he is Masavot Siman Lebanim, meaning everything that the, uh, our patriarchs, our Avot taught us, is like kryptonite to the devil. Furthermore, all the work that our Avot did, Avraham, besides the ten Nisyonot, how he taught us Chesed and Kiruv, Yitzhak with his Mesirut Nefesh, self sacrifice, how he was willing to sacrifice his own life for Kadosh Baruch Hu. And Yaakov, his trials with his evil brother Esav, and a, a crooked father-in-law in Lavan, and the crazy things that happened within his family with uh, what happened with the kidnapping of Dina, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and what happened with the selling of Yosef, they really taught us how to deal with crooked businessmen, uh, troubles within the family, uh, things w uh, things that are uh, negative environments that are around us really gave us all the tools. You can literally go into every parasha and extract a life lesson, a life tool on how to live today. In other words, the patriarchs went through a, a trial, a test, a nisayon. They passed it. And by passing that test, they planted a seed. They planted a uh, then I'm going to call a seed, a zera, almost like a, a you know, a, a seed that later on will grow into a fruit. We'll see the fruits of their labor later on in life. In other words, what? They passed the test, and by doing that, they created the ability for the children to pass the exact same test. And if the children are not able to pass the exact same test, the tools on how to pass through that test is embedded in their DNA. They have the ability. I believe on Shabbat I mentioned that there's even a Gemara that tells us 
that if a person if a person ever finds himself in a fire, he can get out of the fire, the Sfut of Abraham Avinu. If anybody finds himself in jail, he can get out of jail, the Sfut of Yosef HaTzadik. If anybody finds himself in danger of death, he can get out of the danger of death in the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu that had the sword over his neck. And on and on and on and on. I think the Gemara actually says it over there that the last Yeshua was the Yeshua of, uh, of Esther. Well, first of all, how do we get saved from hanging? We got saved from hanging from Mordechai, from the Purim story. And after Esther, there's no more Yeshua. Meaning what? There's no more salvations after the story of Esther. Why? Because all the Yeshua are open. All the Yeshua are open to the Jewish people. We always have a way out of getting out of anything. Why? Ma'aseh avot, siman lebanim. When you get to the end of Sefer Bereshit, we see that we reach a point where there's no more avot. We know that avot maknim kelim la'iladim, that the, the, the patriarchs are able, able to pass on the tools to their children. And towards the end of Bereshit, there's no more avot. It's Yaakov, and then we have Yosef. Hazal tell us that Yosef was supposed to be an Av also. He was also supposed to be an Av. However, he lost the ability to be an Av through one of his trials. However, he still has the same power like an Av. As a matter of fact, in Parashat Miketz, this week's parasha, there's a pasuk. Perot was so impressed with uh, with Yosef, not only for his dream interpretations, but he was so impressed with him as an individual. The minute he started to take advice from him, the minute he started to give him some responsibilities in his kingdom, he was able to see that Yosef is a successful manager of his kingdom. And he gave him everything except for the kingship. And he says in Pasuk, in Perk Mem Aleph, he put him in the, in the chariot that is only second to the king. And they called in front of him Avrech. They called him an Avrech. What's an Avrech? Nowadays we know an Avrech is what? A person who goes to Yeshiva and learns all day long. That's an Avrech. Right? Rashi tells us what's Avrech? Av. Bashani, I'm sorry, Av Bechokma, Rach Bashani. He's like an Av in wisdom, and he's uh, Rach, he's soft or young with his age. Meaning, he has the wisdom of a father, but he's young in age. He's an Avrech. And that's what the Torah learners are in the Yeshiva. You go speak to somebody young, their brains are incredible. They have wisdom that, uh, that surpasses their age. And that's what an Avrech is. He's a young guy that has knowledge that surpasses his, his years. However, Avrech also is a hint to us that he's also an Av. Avrech is an Av. What kind of an Av? A hybrid. A hybrid. He's not Av Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. He's uh, one of the sons of Yaakov. But as we said in Parashat Vayeshev, if you recall, the opening line of that parasha was what? The second pasuk, Ele toldot Yaakov, Yosef. When it starts to talk about the offsprings of Yaakov, it was Yosef. And we read, read from the Midrash, Bereshit Abba, and also Yalkut Shimoni brings it, how all the similarities that they had in their life. That everything that Yaakov did was almost identical to Yosef, the same, uh, almost the same life story. With the brother that chased him, uh, with how he's almost, he was almost killed, how the mothers were similar, how the pregnancies were similar, how the birth was similar. So many different things. So he was similar to an Av. Which basically means that the rule that we just learned, the law of Masse Avot Siman Lebanim, that the, that the Avot went through all these trials and tribulations and Nisyonot, 
so they're able for future generations can pass the same you know trials and and and, and uh, difficulties Yosef was able to do that as well as a matter of fact something that Yosef is very famous for it says shaya mesalsel besarotav i am sasel besaro right that he used to beautify himself he used to play with his hair so there's a deep there's a deep kabbalistic concept that deals with hair that anywhere you see hair it's connected to dinim strict judgment so if yosef is playing with strict judgment why would he be playing with strict judgment because yosef was saying if i'm like an av and if i'm going to be able to withstand these tests where in egypt egypt had there's 10 uh, 10 shares of Tum'a in the world. Egypt took 9 of those 10 uh, by, by, by itself and the rest of the world one tenth. So imagine what type of Tum'a was in that place. Yo Yosef was the only Jew in that environment. And what did he say? As long as I'm here, let me get tested. Let me play with the Dinim. Why? Because if I can withstand it in this environment, what does that mean? My children, my children's children, and all the children of Yaakov, I'm like an Av, all of Am Yisrael will be able to be in this type of corrupt, uh, uh, unpure environment, and they'll be able to pass. He took upon himself to pass those tests in order for us to be able to pass those tests for every generation to come after, up until today and forevermore. As a matter of fact, the defining test of Yosef's life story was the test of Eshet Potiphar. Very, very difficult test. A beautiful woman that was convinced that he belonged to her and she wanted him and she yearned from him and she pursued, pursued him day, afternoon, at night with different outfits and different hairdos and different perfumes and different advances. We just did the whole uh, lesson of Zulicha. Unbelievable things. People are calling me, saying, I never knew anything on that lesson. People are literally calling me about this, uh, about this class, how much they enjoyed it. It was such a beautiful lesson, in depth about this woman. And the fact that he was able to withstand in Egypt, on that day, with that woman, he earned the title of Yosef, at Sadiq. Yosef at Sadiq got the title of Yosef at Sadiq after he passed the test of Eshet Potiphar, Zulicha. Meaning that the whole test of Arayot, the thing that defines us as Jews, that there's certain borders that we don't cross, certain relationships that we're not allowed to have, he strengthened us in, the, in that sense. And because he did, because he did, the Jews in Egypt did not sin in that realm for 210 years. Imagine 210 years being around Abu Dazara, people that are half naked, nine tenths of the Tuma, witchcraft, black magic, nobody. Not one Jewish woman went with another Egyptian man, and not a Jewish man went with an Egyptian woman. So, how is Yosef? So up until here, you probably guys know everything. Everything was a, re a repeat. But it was also a good introduction and good review. How is Yosef HaTzaddik connected to Hanukkah? Being that today is the second day of Hanukkah, it's good to always talk about the spiritual energy that's in the air. We know that we have... Uh, an eight-day envelope of spirit, special spiritual powers that if you tap into them at the right time, the work that you do now gives you the sa'at and the shmaya, the heavenly help for the rest of the year. So let's find out what's available to us in these days. Let's activate it. And in eight days, we tell Hashem, thank you for the opportunity. And for the rest of the year, we have a big sa'at and the shmaya with anything that's connected to this holiday. 
Today I would like to focus in on a couple of things. There's many things, but I'd like to focus in on a couple of things that have to do with light and darkness. Let's start with understanding the holiday. Hanukkah. The main focus of the Greeks was to nullify from the Jewish people the Midat Yosef HaTzadik, the quality of Yosef HaTzadik. What's the quality of Yosef HaTzadik? What defined him? That he is able to say no to Arayot, to be in the middle of a place of Tum'ah and resist it, to be able to withstand that test. The Greeks said, that's exactly what we're going to attack. Whatever Yosef represented, we're going to go after. And what was it exactly? Shmirat Hayesod. Shmirat Hayesod is protecting the Brit. As a matter of fact, Yosef, the numerical value of Yosef is the same numerical value of Melech Yavan. The king of Greece is the same numerical value as Yosef. What does that mean? Anytime there's the same numerical value, we know that what? That it has the power to nullify it. We just learned it. How do you beat the Yetzara? Follow the ways of the fathers. Here again, how do we beat the king of Yavan? The Midah of Yosef. And vice versa. What did they want to do in order to beat the Midah of Yosef? They brought Melech Yavan. And by the way, what was the na name of this king? Antiochus. Which by the way, the numerical value of Antiochus is the same numerical value as Yosef. So, Melech Yavan and Yosef is the I'm uh, sorry, Melech Yavan and Antiochus both are numerical value of Yosef. Now, in Bereshit Rabbah, it tells us what was their tactics? What was the tactics of the Greeks that they used to nullify the Midah of the Yesod, the Midah of Yosef HaTzadik? They wrote on Keren HaShor, En Lachem Chelek Beloke Yisrael. They would uh, take the, the ox that plows and they would write on the horn of the ox, "En lachem chelik belokei Israel." You have no share in the in the uh, in the in the God of Israel. And by the way, that same horn, they would cut it off, make it hollow, turn it into a baby bottle, and the baby would drink the milk from that horn, and he would see the exact same thing. "En lachem chelik belokei Israel." Now their main purpose or their main intention was to extract from the Jewish people the Midat of Yosef HaTzadik. And how do we know that? Because Yosef HaTzadik has a pasuk in the Torah that says, Bechor Shoro Hadarlo. Yosef HaTzadik has an animal that is connected to him, which is a shor, a bull, an ox. So what did they do for the, the Yosef, who's Bechor Shoro Hadarlo? That was one of the blessings that he got. You see the word Shor, ox? What did they do? They took the horn of an ox and wrote that over there. Exact, meaning, we're, we're, go, we're letting you know that we're going for the Midat of Yosef. By the way, also when it says, Vayarem Keren Meshicho, we say it in Birkat Amazon, we say it in the Amidah, that Hashem will lift the, 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 the horn of Mashiach. What does that mean? Vayerem keren Mashiach. We know when Mashiach comes, there's Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David. Vayerem keren to uplift the horn of Mashiach. That's Mashiach ben Yosef. He's the first one. Why does it say keren? Because the horn belongs to who? To the ox, and the ox is Yosef. Vayerem keren Mashiach is to give us a hint of Mashiach ben Yosef. So we see that they're looking to attack the Midah of Yosef HaTzadik. 
So what was their tactic? If you're going to go against someone who's protecting his breed, what's the first thing you go for? Breed Mila. That's the first thing that they outlawed. The Yavanim decreed that the Jewish people cannot circumcise their boys. Not only that, that's not the only thing that they went after. They didn't just go after the boys, they went after the girls as well. As a matter of fact, it said they decreed that every single Jewish girl that's about to get married, she must have relations with Hagmon before she goes into her chupa. Imagine a girl about to get married, she found the love of her life. They're about to get under the chupa, about to get married. They're going to consummate the marriage. Betula, she's going to have her, you know, uh, you know what every man and woman wish for is to find their husband and wife. All of a sudden, before the woman goes into the chupa, comes a rasha, hagmon, says, no, me first. That was one of the decrees that they had at that time. No circumcision for the boys, and to sleep with the woman before... To have relations with the, with the bride before she goes under the chuppah. Could you imagine anybody that went through that? That she's with a rasha, a few minutes later, she's walking down the aisle for a chuppah, getting married. Look how wicked they were. As a matter of fact, we see these two decrees hinted in two pesukim. In the Midrash, in Bereshit Abba, there's a pasuk in Bereshit that says, Va'aretz ha'ita tohu vohu v'choshech. In the beginning of time, it talks about how there was chaos and it was darkness. It says over there, in Bereshit Rabbah, when it says, Choshech, Choshech zu Yavan. Eh? Choshech, that's the Yavanim. Imagine, you're on the first pages of Bereshit. They say darkness. The rabbis tell us, Yavan. What's the connection? Not only that, if we go further down to Brit Ben Abetarim, right? The, the covenant that Abraham did with Kadosh Baruch Hu. And it says over there that the darkness came and Abraham fell asleep and he got scared from the vision that he saw, if you remember, with the bird coming down. It says, V'inei ma chashecha gedola. And over there it says again, Hashecha zu Yavan. Once again, the minute it mentions darkness, it says it's Yavan. So when it was Choshech in Bereshit, that's Yavan. When it's Hashecha in Brit Ben Abitaim, that's also Yavan. So the Midrash tells us, what, what, why is Yavan mentioned in both places? He says the Choshech was from, uh, uh, in the form of male, Zachar, Choshech, and Hashecha is for female. This is to hint to us that the Yevanim are going to come in the future and they're going to go after the boys and the girls. They're going to bring the darkness on both the male and the female. So how were we able to withstand this darkness? How were we able to withstand the Egyptians? I'm sorry, not the Egyptians. The Greeks. Kedushato Shor Yosef HaTzadik. If it wasn't for Yosef HaTzadik, we would not have been able to withstand the trial of the Greeks. Why? Because of Amidato ben Yisrael in Meshet Potiphar. If Yosef didn't withstand the test of Meshet Potiphar, the Jews in the story of Hanukkah were not able to withstand this decree of the Greeks. What do we say? They planted a seed in Mitzrayim hundreds and hundreds of and hundreds and hundreds of years later, how did the Jews get saved? Yosef HaTzadik. Who even thinks about Yosef HaTzadik when you're thinking about Hanukkah? Furthermore, because Yosef, not only with Eshet Potiphar, but in general, guarded himself from improper relations when he was in Egypt, in his merit, all the Jews that were in Egypt were protected while they were there, and the protection continues for all the generations to come. Imagine, there is a, a certain desire or a certain vice in the world called arayot, the physical pleasures, 
physical pleasures that are not uh, that are not uh, not warranted, but let's say they're not proper in the eyes of Hashem, and we're not allowed to do them. And it's our uh, and it's our duty to guard ourselves from those types of relations. Who gives us the power? Who gives us the power to succeed, to resist? Yosef Tzadik. Both in the story of Hanukkah, both in the story of Egypt, and both in our lives today. Yosef Tzadik. Maaseh Avot, Siman Ebani. From here we come to our first lesson. From here we start to, to start to extract tools for life. What's tool for, tools for life? Sometimes it's great when you learn a story that happened a few thousand years ago. You're like, okay, it was a history lesson. But what were you saying in this class all the time? I want to walk out of this door and I want to live out the lesson that I just learned. I want to know that this Torah is as fresh as today's newspaper, right? That is as fresh as this moment. Not some stale story that we tell our children that is the, you know, the Jews from the desert. No. What does it mean to me today? So since there is this spiritual energy that's available during this time, we want to tap into it. We want to do the work during this time. So we'll have the Seat of the Shemaya for the rest of the year. So I have Yoram Michael Abrajel Zechet Sadiq Libacha in his book, Ibre Noam, about the Moadim, says as such that it's appropriate for a person to make a huge effort during the days of Hanukkah, the holy days of Hanukkah, to add more in two things Shmirat Enaim and Sniot. Since Yosef Tzadik is Shmirat Hayesod, What's upon us to do in order to strengthen Shmirat HaYesod, to strengthen our holiness in this realm and to have this protection that is very much needed in Miami and very much needed in this day and age and in this society and in the world we live in? Guard our eyes, increase our snoot. In the next eight days or seven days that are left, be careful what you see on social media, internet, online, TV, if that's where you're going. Be careful when you walk down the street. Look down. Try not to look at inappropriate things, inappropriate ads, inappropriate newspapers, inappropriate people that are not dressed modestly. Turn away. That turn of the head will do you wonders for the next of the year. That closing of the eyes, that shutting down that YouTube, that shutting down that social media for the next upcoming year will do wonders in you being able to be power, to be protected in Shmirat Yisod, Shmirat Enayim, Sniut. If the if the skirts are up to the knee, how about past the knee? If they're past the knee, maybe a little bit further down, maybe covering the elbows, maybe covering the neck bone, maybe a little bit more, uh, you know, clothes that are not so tight. Whatever it is, men. The tzniut of men that also they have to protect themselves and have to know what's the proper way to wear and what they have to cover. It's not so simple shorts and a tank top. It's not so simple for a man. Look into tzniut and see what it says. How do you walk around the house? How do you walk around the house? What are you wearing? Sni'ut and Shviyat Naim during these days will increase a person's holiness for the entire year. You get like a mega turbo boost of, of, of power when you put in the work during these eight days. So imagine, bunker down for the next eight days, you say, this is what I'm going to do. And the rest of the year is a Sa'at HaDishmai. Furthermore, the rabbi is saying, look at the, at the candles. Just at staring at the candles helps a person reach sanctity. Especially in Kedushat Ha'inayim. Meaning what? We just talked about Shemirat Ha'inayim, right? What's going to help even more? Look at the candles. Look at those candles 
It's going to do a clean up for the eyes and it's going to help you protect your eyes for the upcoming year. Why? He says, inside the candles, there's a special spiritual light called Or Haganuz, which we'll talk about in depth maybe a little bit later. This Or Haganuz, the book Bnei Sashar, and that says it in B'Shem Arokeach, who received this from Eliyahu Navi that says, look at the candles, it helps a person with this Kedusha, and helps a person with the Kedusha of the Enayim. So nowadays you should know, it's a real, the struggle is real. It's not so simple to keep the eyes uh, clean. You used to have to go to stores or to places or to different places in the world to see all these crazy things. Today it's in the palm of your hand. What a person would see once, twice, three times, five times, ten times in a lifetime, they can see a hundred times in an hour on a, on a handout. The way we sin with our eyes is on a wholesale level. It's not like it used to be before. The, the, the phone has brought so many things and, and they made it where it's like shorts. You know, quick, five seconds. Okay, now sin again with something else, 10 seconds. Now sin again with something else, eight seconds. They make it short, why? Wholesale. A hundred times an hour we need you. Five times in a lifetime is too slow. We need the eyes to sin. How do we keep it holy? Look at the candles, you left out to the shrine. Interesting. I like to call this the alley-oop to the dunk, for those of you that, understand, that play basketball. It's interesting that what we're dealing with in the ways of Hanukkah, in Parashat Miketz, which is basically the end of Bereshit. Next week is Vayigash, uh, after that it's Vayichi, and Bereshit is over. And as soon as Bereshit is over, what do we start? We start the time of Shovavim. Shemot, Vaera, Bo, Beshalach, Itro, Mishpatim. And we know that the Shovavim period is a special period of what? Tikkun HaYesod. So, you have Hanukkah that throws you the ball, start to get ready, start to get holy, come the time of the Shovavim, you slam dunk, that's it, now's the Tikkun of the Yesod. The Arizal says that these days of the Shovavim, meaning the six week period, when we read those parashiyot, there's a, it's another spiritual envelope. Another work to do. What's to do during those six weeks that a person is able to create a, a tremendous amount of tikkunim? Ms. Darizal says in Shah Ruach HaKodesh, Mesugalim beyotel etaken et kol ha'inyanim kakshurim emidat ha'yesod. A person is able to rectify all things that are connected to what they sinned with the yesod. Men and women. Men and women. continues to say that in those specific days, yes, there's an incredible se'ata deshmai, a heavenly help to anybody who desires to sanctify themselves during that time, he'll succeed. Meaning sometimes people are, are, are struggling with it. It's difficult. I can't stop looking at this website. I can't stop looking at this magazine. I can't stop looking at this social media. I can't stop with this thing or with that thing. All, you know, whatever people are struggling with, they say, check yourself into Shovavim. Go into Shovavim, do the work during that time. You'll have Sata Deshmaya. Hashem will give you angels and, and the heavenly help that will help you get out of this and also to sanctify or to rectify what a person did in the past. There's some people uh, during the Shovavim that do a lot of work. The fasting on Mondays and uh, Thursdays. There's some people that fast all week. There's some people that fast five weeks. It counts as 40, it counts as... Uh, there's a thousand, there's all these uh, calculations for the fasting that people can do. And it sanctifies. I saw it somewhere else abroad that a person, if he does this just one time in his lifetime, he does it one time in his lifetime, when he goes up to the Shaman, don't even talk about it. They don't even ask him about it. They don't even ask about those sins.
another thing about Yosef and Hanukkah. If you go to Parashat Miketz, this week's parasha, actually, how ironic that we can draw from this week's parasha and connect it to Pesach. Obviously, it's not a coincidence, it's by design. Peresh Perek Mem Gimel, Pasuk Lamedalet. I'm just going to fast forward to the story where the brothers came to Egypt and they brought Binyamin and Yosef already gave him the, the already gave him the, the food and then the whole thing with the gavia, the whole thing with the goblet and then later on uh, when he revealed himself and then he came back and he says okay go back to Abba right and tell him that I'm alive and he gave them each one gifts and to his brother Binyamin it says in Pasuk Lamedalet he gave to his brother Binyamin five times more than what he gave all his brothers. In reality, he gave him five suits. Right? But it says over here, yadot. What's yad? Yad is a hand. Right? It's interesting that the Torah uses the language Chamesh Yadot, five hands. What did we say? Maseh Avot, Siman Lebanim. We said that Yosef is planting seeds, just like Abraham, it's like Yaakov. He's planting Yeshuot, he's planting salvations. For when? Now? For later. He's doing, giving his brother, Binyamin, five suits. What's going on over here? On whose portion of Eretz Yisrael is, is the Bet HaMikdash built on? Binyamin. During the time of Hanukkah, right, there's going to be the Yevanim that are coming to Bet HaMikdash. He's going to need help. What does Yosef do? Open up the Sidur, go to the Amidah. What do we say? There's a special thing that we must say when we are in Hanukkah, what is it? What's the special supplication that we say during Hanukkah? Al Anisim. If you pay attention to the wording of Al Anisim, it goes, "Vata berachamech harabim," and you, with your great mercy, "Amata lehem beetzaratam." You stood for them in the time of their troubles. Rafta et rivam, you fought their fight. Danta et dinam, you you uh, you 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 exacted their judgment. Nakamta et nikmatam, you 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 uh, revenge their uh, you revenge their revenge. And then it says here, and count with me, one word. How many times it comes up? Masata giborim beyad chalashim. There's the word yad. Verabim beyad. Me'atim. Urshaim beyad tzadikim. Utmeim beyad tehorim. Vezedim beyad osket ratecha. Five hands. It says the word yad five times. What does the Pasuk say? Chamesh yadot. Why chamesh yadot? This chamesh yadot that he gave in Parashat Miketz gave us in the story of Hanukkah that Hashem put the giborim, the strong, beyad halashim, in the hand of the weak. And He put the many in the hand of the few. And the wicked in the hand of the righteous. And the, and the impure in the hands of the pure. And the heretics in the hands of the Torah learners. Five times hands. How did such a small family was able to be such a huge Greek army? Yosef. Yosef Atzadi. Once again, we have Hanukkah, and we see one of the biggest things that, one of the biggest hidden uh, secrets is that our secret to success was what? Yosef. Yosef, the Avrech, the hybrid Av that planted his own seeds. That later on what? Came to fruition. As we see in the story of Hanukkah.
Yosef was able to withstand this test of Eshet Potiphar, and in return, we had the power to overpower the Choshech of Yavan, the darkness of Yavan. They wanted to, what? They wanted to We were able to overpower Yavan. Yosef was their kryptonite. Yosef was the kryptonite to Melech Yavan. Yosef was the kryptonite to Antiochus. How? They're hundreds and hundreds of years apart. How can Yosef be the kryptonite to Antiochus? He planted the seed. Masav what's in We see that the spiritual darkness that the, 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 the Greeks wanted to implement about on the Jewish people is one was their big attack was about the, the Yesod, Yesod of Yosef. But there were other things. Shabbat, they didn't want us to keep. Rosh Chodesh, they didn't want us to keep. Brit Milah, they didn't want us to keep. Learning the Torah, they didn't want us to keep. All the things that what? That define Jewish people. They wanted to put us in darkness. Maybe it's a good time to go into it. What's Shabbat? Shabbat is the one day out of the week that we do what? We rest and we rejuvenate. We renew ourselves. Not only are we able to have a day of rest, it's the holiest day of the week. We plug into all the spirituality that's available on that day. But what else do we do? We draw all the success of the upcoming week. As it says in the Chadodi, Kehi me'en ha-beracha. Mekor ha-beracha. The source of all the blessings of the upcoming week come from where? From the Shabbat. They wanted to take that away from us. Shabbat is, is where we renew ourselves. Chodesh, Rosh Chodesh. It's in the word. Chidush, it's Chodesh. What's the Chodesh? That's when we, that's how we know how to intercalate the calendar. That's how we know when the days are supposed to be for the holidays and for all the special spiritual uh, prime times that we look for throughout the year. The way that it used to be back in the days is two witnesses would come. They would testify where they were, the time that they were, uh, the position that they saw the moon. They would get uh, interrogated by Ansheikh Neset Agdola. And if they were correct, that's it. They said the month. And that's how we know that if Pesach is going to be today or tomorrow. Whether we know if it's going to be, if Hametz is allowed today, if Hametz is not allowed today. Or, how about Yom Kippur? If we know if we fast today, or we fast tomorrow. These are very important things. Things that you have to know. They wanted to take it away. No Rosh Chodesh, no Itchachut. No finding out where your spiritual prime times are. So you can get plugged into, and, and draw the Ruchaniyu, the spirituality that you, that you seek. They didn't want us to learn Chamishah Kum Sheh Torah. Right? The Torah. The Torah, what, is the, what are we sharing now, right now? Chidushim. Right? Torah nuances. As a matter of fact, you go to any good library in Yeshiva, books and books and books and books of what? Chidushim. Nuances on the Torah. This rabbi found this, and that rabbi found that, and this rabbi sees it, sees it through this lens, and that rabbi sees it through that lens. Chidushim and chidushim and chidushim. The chidushim, the nuances of the Torah. No, you're not going to look at use the Torah as a book of instruction, a book of life. It's a philosophy. Read it, just like, just like astrology, just like history. Torah, another book of stories, not a way of life. Brit Mila, Brit Mila, that's the, the that's the gateway to Judaism. A Jew, a, a boy, that does not have 
a brit milah, he doesn't take away the orla. It's a person that's living with walls and barricades and blocks and spiritual us and klipot. He can never tap into Judaism. He can never tap into spirituality. Why? The gateway to Judaism is what a child does in eight days. The brit milah. That was taken away. So if we take a look at what they tried to take away from us, the Shabbat, the Milah, the Chodesh, and the Hay, which is five for Hamisha from Torah, what does that spell out? It's the acronym, the Rashi Tavot Simcha, happiness. Simcha is Shabbat, Milah, Chodesh, and the Hay is Hamisha from Torah. They wanted to take our happiness. They wanted to take our happiness and they want to put us in darkness. Because a Jew is a Jew is constantly in a state of renewal. You can't be a Jew and be stagnant. It doesn't work for our neshama. The way we're wired, we constantly need to renew ourselves. Everything that has to do with us is connected to renewal. And if we don't have a renewal, then we start to fall into darkness. The light begins to dim. And that's what they wanted. They wanted the light to dim. To a point till it's completely gone. Let's talk about light. Rabbi Nachman from Breslev in Likutei Moran says something very interesting. In order to, to bring peace into the world, in order for the world that we live in to be a peaceful planet, in order for peace to be all over the world, there's a formula. What's the formula to peace? It tells us. In order to draw peace into the world, we have to elevate God's honor to its root, to its main place, to its essence. What does that mean? If we are able to elevate God's honor to its original place, the result of that is peace in the world. Rabbi Nachman from Breslov continues to elaborate and says, Hainu In other words, you have to have the fear of God. How? He's going to now connect peace and fear of God in a pasuk. As it says in Sefer Devarim, et Hashem To fear the honorable God. Now, he starts to open it up. First it's cryptic, then we begin to understand it a little bit more, then it becomes something practical. Let's see. Ve'i efshar la'alot et ha'kavod ela al yedet Torah chesed. He says, you're not able to elevate God's honor unless you learn Torah Chesed. What does that mean? What's Torah Chesed? Torah with kindness? Kindness of Torah? So, now we got to go deeper and understand what is Torah Chesed. The Torah Chesed of Ruch HaChemenu Zichamon Vacha in Masechet Sukkah on the 49th page on the second side what is the definition of Torah Chesed, which, which yields a result of peace in the world, because we're able to elevate God's honor back to its original root place. What is that? Zehu halomet Torah al menat Somebody who learns Torah in order to teach it. That is the definition of Torah Chesed. And this is the main, 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 main honor of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is when somebody learns Torah and teaches it. That is Torah Chesed. Continues to elaborate and says that the main reason why there's conflict in the world, the main reason why there's fighting in the world, the main reason why there's war in the world, the main reason why there's machloket, the re- the, is because there is Hoshech and Bilbul in the world. There's darkness 
and there's confusion in the world. Once again, cryptic. What's darkness? What's confusion? Give me details. I want to understand it better. He says, when, when there is light in the world, immediately all the confusion disappears, all the conflict disappears, and peace increases in the world. The minute there is light in the world, all of that dissipates and peace increases. Anytime I hear that, I get so confused. What light? The minute there's light in the world. What? LED lights? What? Fluorescent lights? Which lights? Street lights? Which lights are we talking about? Sometimes you always talk about, sometimes you see the Balet Shuva. You see them, oh, Hubeorot, Hubeorot, he's completely lit. What, what does that mean? It's always so confusing when they say darkness, light. Explain it to me. I want to understand what is darkness. I want to understand what is light. Look Hashem to explain to us. It says, What is light that dissipates darkness? And maybe we'll, we'll just uh, explain it here. Darkness is conflict. Darkness is war. Darkness is confusion in the world. Darkness is a lack of peace in the world. That's darkness. How do you make that go away? Which, by the way, if we stop right here, is the world in that state? Is the world in a state of darkness? Absolutely. There's war in the world. There's confusion in the world. There's a lack of peace in the world. There's hate in the world. More than anything else. Or at least they make sure to report only that. So how do you make all that go away? Light. What is light? Mazaor that is, has the power to bring all this peace into the world. Ora shela Torah hakedusha, the light of the Torah. Just like we say en mayim en la Torah, just like we say everywhere you say water, plug in instead of when you say water, plug in the word Torah. New uh, uh, new lesson. Anywhere you see the word light, plug in Torah. It says or it's oraita. Oraita, Torah. That's why in Aramaic the Torah is called Oraita. It's a source of light. As it says in Mishle, Shlomo Melech, the smartest man to ever live, says, He said that the, the, the Torah is light. And anybody who publicizes this light in the world, publicizes, promotes Torah in this world, they are an agent that helps increase peace in the world. So, for example, if somebody is part of a weekly Torah lesson, they're increasing Torah in the world. If somebody put together a Shabbaton that had five Torah classes in it, that increased peace in the world. If a person just sits down and learns Torah, they just increase peace in the world. Why? Because the minute you learn Torah, there's no chance that you heard something delicious that you don't go and repeat it. It's something that like bubbles up over here and the first person you can repeat it to, you go to. I know from experience. You can't hear a juicy Torah nugget and not share it. Some people fish, save it for Shabbat. Some people save it to the next person that they meet. I actually have a few friends that I call and I let them know I got one. And we schedule a call to exchange you have to share it. And that increases peace in the world. Now, when the world starts to go low on Torah learning, darkness seeps in. When the Torah learning is not strong in the world, darkness seeps in. There's no peace. There's war. There's conflict. There's hatred. And the, the world feels uh, devoid of holiness and you see that there's a lot of machloket in Merivot. All of a sudden the governments don't get along, people in the street don't get along, husband and wives don't get along, children don't get along, countries don't get along, races don't get along. What happened? Where is this beautiful world Hashem created where we should all live in peace? Right? Is that a concept only for hippies from the 60s? No. Hashem didn't create the world so we should be at war and in conflict. We have to find ways to live together. Rabbi Nachman continues to say, 
the Torah that a person teaches another person, he illuminates his own darkness. His own darkness. And then, as a result of that, the world. And through this process, he's able to dissipate his own darkness, the darkness into the world, increases the light in the world, and all of a sudden, peace comes in. What a butterfly effect, what a ripple effect, right? A person learn, you know, puts light into them, they learn Torah, their darkness goes away. In return, when they share it with somebody else, they, they, they are able to make the other people's darkness go away. And what is the result? World peace. So when you look around and you look at the news and you see how the world is going crazy, you're like, oh, what's going to be? When is it going to be peace in the world? Just open a chumash. Open the Torah. Listen to a class. Increase the peace in the world. How do we know that that's the formula? Because Masechet Brachot, on the 64th page, on the first side, says a very famous chazal that we say every day in tefillah. Talmidei Chachamim Marbim Shalom Ba'olam Torah learners increase peace in the world. All those guys that are sitting in yeshivas, what are they doing? They're increasing peace in the world. Oh, they're doing nothing. They're reading books from 2,000 years ago. That's what you want from your life? Is that what you want to do? That's what you do all day? You read books from 2,000 years ago? Really? That's what you want for yourself? Don't you want more out of your life? We've heard people say that to, to religious Jews. But what are they doing? They are increasing peace in the world. Imagine if they stop. Chaz v'shalom. If the world is already like this, what would it be if they stopped learning? And this is why the whole Indian of Chanukah is to what? To add light into the world. To increase light in the world. And what is the light that we're supposed to increase in the world? The light that is emanated from the Torah learning. Because the desire and the purpose, the main purpose of the Yevanim was in order for us to forget the Torah. Like we say in Al-Anisim, what do we say? What's the language? What's the text? That the kingdom of, of Greece, the evil kingdom of Greece, stood on top of Am Yisrael. And what was their sole purpose? For them to forget your Torah. And that's what they did. You can have the Torah on the shelf, but not as a way of life. It's an old book that maybe you touch once every while, once in a while if you want to hear the story of Adam and Eve and the apple. Right? If you want to hear the story of the splitting of the sea. But not as a way of life. I want to ask you a question. What is the iconic Jewish symbol of Am Yisrael? When you think of the Jewish people, what symbol do you think of? Birds. Birds? Birds of peace? Star of David. Star of David? The Torah? Menorah. The menorah. What? When you see the symbol of the menorah, tell me one nation that you think of immediately. The Jews. The menorah is our symbol. Why? Why is a candelabra the symbol of a Jew? Why is that our symbol? So the menorah is the symbol of the Jew. Is because what is the function of a candelabra? To give light. Why is that our symbol? Because it's our job to be a light unto the nations. Hashem put us into this world to be a source of light unto the nations. What light is it? The light of the Torah. We learn Torah and we emanate this light into the world and we light up the world. As a matter of fact, something that maybe you've never noticed before. We know that 
the 67th chapter of Tehillim, Lamnatzeh ben Ginot Mizmor Shir, in many Sidurim, is in the shape of a menorah, right? Sometimes you have it like the rounded menorah. This is a different shita. It's like this. I think in the end of the book I have maybe all the shitot. No, it's not here. But anyways, you know, whether it's the round one or whether it's this uh, this shita over here. Okay, here. Okay. So we, the menorah. David Amelech, when he used to go to war, on his shield, he would have the menorah written in, in the 67th chapter of Tehillim. And what's interesting about it, if you look into the wording, there's one thing that pops up over and over and over and over again. You think that the symbol that symbolizes the Jewish people would have the Jewish people mentioned in it. But rather, it mentions the Gentiles more times than the Jews. You ready for this? I'm going to count with my fingers how many times the Gentiles are mentioned in this Perek uh, Tehillim and it's in the form of the Menorah. Lamasach b'ginot mizmoshim. It mizmoshim. Again, you heard you heard Israel over there, Bnei Israel, Yehudim, Amim, Goim. Let's continue. Ismechu ve'enim leumim. Leumim is another word for nations. Ki tishpot Amim mishol. Six times already, we just mentioned different words that mean other nations. We're up to eight, all different nations. Right? So now we're nine times, nine mentions of people, none of them are Jews. Why? Because the Menorah is telling us that what? We are a light unto the nations. That's our essence. That's what we're here to do. We're here to learn Torah. That's the Or. That light is the light that we give off into the world. And by us being Jews, living as Jews, we increase peace in the world. Why is there a lack of peace in the world? Because we're not learning Torah. What's the statistic? We said 80, 20, 70, 30, whatever it is. We need to, you know, if the statistic was better, you'd see Arabs and Jews hugging, right? You'd be, see a, a, a Esav and Yaakov, you know? But what is it? There's a lack of poor learning in the world, lack of light or in the world. And what's our essence? Our essence is to be a light unto the nations. i ask you another question. So he said the iconic symbol of Am Yisrael is what? The menorah. Why do we celebrate Hanukkah? Why do we celebrate Hanukkah? Because it was increased in light. Increased the light, okay, give me some more. Give me a first grade answer. Why do we celebrate Hanukkah? One day of oil last eight days. Thank you. I Thank you. Ask anybody, and they tell you why we celebrate Hanukkah, because a small jug of oil lasted for eight days. Stop right here. Let me tell you what happened in the story of Hanukkah. Look at these mega things that we're overlooking. Why aren't we celebrating Hanukkah? Because a small family of Hashmonaim killed uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of Greek soldiers. They went to war on day one. That is the biggest story in history. Never again would we hear. It's like uh, me telling Judah, Judah, gather a couple of guys, we're going to go fight Canada. What? <laughs> Makes no sense. Isn't that a great story? Shouldn't we be celebrating Hanukkah because of that? 
How about the fact that everybody went off the deck or B'tifnim and they came back? Should we celebrate that? Why are all the things that sticks out the most that we teach our children and even up until today as adults that we celebrate that a small jug of oil was found and lasted eight days? I'd like to argue that it's not the biggest thing that happened. But yet it's the biggest focus of this holiday. Why? Well, what's this little jug of oil? This little jug of oil is what gives light. What are we about as Jews? We're all about the light. We're all about the oil. This little jug of oil signifies that there was nothing left of the Jewish people. There was just a small little family that was willing to, that, that did not become like the Yavanim and was willing to fight for it. A small little jug of oil, a small little group of people, a small little light of oil that's left in the world. And from this little light, we came back to what? Look at us today. The big story is that number one, we never celebrate death. You'll never see any Jewish holiday that says, hey, we won the greatest war ever. Let's celebrate. Right? We don't, we don't, you know, many countries celebrate, uh, you know, winning wars. We never do that. We don't celebrate the splitting of the sea because people drowned in the sea. You never see that. Right? What do we celebrate? We always celebrate our spiritual successes. You'll never see us celebrating something negative or something that is evil. What are we celebrating? We're celebrating the light. The small little light that almost got extinguished. That no longer was there going to be a Jewish nation. But a small little pach. Small little pach. Small little oil. Small little light was still left in the world. And from that little light, we're able to come and bring it back. To the millions of people that we are today. Hundreds and hundreds of years later, we're still here. The little pach of Shemin, which is who we are compared to the entire world. When you take the billions of people, compared the 8 billion people or 9 billion people that the world is right now, compared to the 14 million Jews, what do we look like in the eyes of the people? A small pach of Shemin. It creates light. But the more we learn Torah, that small little pach turns into a, a flame. And that's what we celebrate, pach shel shemen, because it's connected to light. We are all about the light. And the light, when we say light, move the word light, replace it with Torah. That's who we are. That's our essence. That's what we're here for. That's why we have this book of instructions. That's why the Torah is here, 613 ways how to increase light in the world. 613 ways how to get plugged into being godly. We are the, the, the promoters of Hashem in this world. We are the, the, the human examples of what it means to be godly in a physical form. And the more we run away from it, the more there's darkness in the world. The more we get closer to it, the more there's light in the world. And when there's light, then what is it? A world that we all want to live in. A peaceful world. We spoke about Oraganuz, this light that we see in the candles. I want to give you some background about Oraganuz, and then I want to finish with a with a story about Baba Meir, Rabbi uh, Baba Sali's grandson, and Oraganuz. I believe I shared the story before. Uh, if you heard it before, enjoy it again. If not, you'll love this story. Let's get started with understanding Oraganuz. Rabbi Tzvi Elimelech Midinov, the author of Ney Sachar, writes in his book that he received from the Rokeach and he received it from Eliyahu Navi that in the candles of Hanukkah there is this light called Or Haganuz. We mentioned it earlier in the class. Now we'll go a little bit more in depth into it. And because there is this special light inside the Hanukkah candles, 
This is exactly why we light 36 candles. When you buy in the supermarket, there's 44 candles, right? Why? Eight of them are Shamashim, and 36 is what we really light. So why do we, why do we light 36 candles? Corresponding to the 36 hours that Oraganuz served Adam Rishon. In the first 36 hours of creation, which were the first 12 hours of Erev Shabbat, the following 12 hours of Lel Shabbat, and the following 12 hours of Yom Shabbat, those, that total of 36 hours, there was a special light in the world, a spiritual light. And it served for 36 hours. And they correspond to the 36 tzaddikim that Kadosh Baruch Hu puts in every generation. And those 36 tzaddikim know how to take advantage of this light. What do you mean take advantage of this light? What does this light have? Well, this light, first of all, is a holy light. The way that we know it is how do we bless on the candles? What do we say? These candles, oh, they're holy. We're not allowed to use them. When's the last time you had something kadosh in your home? Those candles are holy. What, where did they get their sanctity from? Where did they get their holiness from? Why? Because from within them shines this holy light called Oraganus. And by the way, it's also hinted, this hidden light in the candles in the month that we're in. What month are we in? Kislev. If you take the word Kislev and cut it into two, Chas Lamedvav. Chas is like a sot, to cover. Lamedvav is the numerical value of 36. Lamed is 30, Vav is 6. We hide the Oraganus inside the 36 candles. That's Kislev. The 36 candles that has the hidden light that, that, uh, that was available in the world for the first 36 hours. Now, why only 36 hours? Why don't we still have this light in our life today? Why isn't Oraganus part of our regular existence? So in Masechet Chagiga, on the 12th page on the first side, he says that Kadosh Baruch Hu looked at the world and he saw that a person with this light is able to look from here to the other end of the world with his naked, naked eye. That was the power of this light. Imagine being here, thinking of New Zealand, and with your naked eye, you can look all the way to New Zealand. So Akadosh Baruch Hu said, what's going to happen with somebody that understands the power of this light? He says, a person that can see me so far along, so far, from one end of the world to the, to the other end, he says the Rishayim are, are, are destined to use it in this world. And because what would they do? Let's imagine there's some crook in Miami. He's looking all the way at some guy in England, taking off his jewelry, his Rolex and his diamonds. And he moves the Mona Lisa and he puts it behind inside of a safe and he sees the code and he gets on a plane and he goes and he goes into the house and he has the codes, and he comes and he can rob. He said that the, the, the wicked people would use it for what? They would use it for bad. So what did he do? He took this light away from the world, and he did three things with it. He buried it inside the Torah. He buried this light inside the Hanukkah candles, and he also reserved it for the tzaddikim. In the, you know, in, in, in the future, this light will be available for the righteous. They'll be, be able to have this power. But right now in this world, this power is available in the Hanukkah candles and in the Torah. And who can use it? Only somebody who has Shemirat right? Somebody who can protect themselves. 
it says, Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh, he said, the, the Baal Shem Tov reveals to us that this light was hidden in the Torah, and any tzaddik, any tzaddik that works hard and learns Torah, but learns Torah in Bikdusha V'Tahara, HaKadosh Baruch Hu illuminates from him, from inside the Torah, the Or Ganuz. And he's able to see from one side of the world to the next. Meaning, a person who is very, very learned and learns Torah in a style of Kedusha V'Tahara, constantly within sanctity and purity, Hashem allows him to use this power in this world. So, two years ago, I had the honor of meeting the great-grandson of the Baba Sali. His name is Rabbi Shimon Abu Chatzera. Happens to be here in Miami this week, actually. He usually comes right before Hanukkah. Two years ago, he, was, uh, he did a special uh, class in one of my friend's houses, and I heard the story directly from him. Clearly shown. Not a story, it's not a story that's been handed down to me, the Baba Sali's grandson shared the story with us. He speaks of Baba Meir, who had this quality. Baba Meir, I believe, was the grandson of uh, Baba Sali. He was very learned, and he was very much uh, a practicing Shmirat Enayim. He was known to not leave his house. All day long, he'd stay home and learn, met with very few people. He was completely like a, a, a spiritual elevation of a human being. And the story goes that while he was alive, there was a gentleman from Argentina who used to come and visit uh, the United States, I'm sorry, used to come visit Israel. And while he visited Israel, he would go to certain yeshivas, he was connected to certain rabbis. He was a nice guy, uh, you know, so, uh, uh, a gvir, somebody who would give a, a lot of donations to a lot of avrechim and to a lot of uh, Torah institutions. During that time, which I believe was the 80s, um, in South America, there was a trend to kidnap Jewish kids and ask for ransom. So this particular gentleman his son got kidnapped and they called him and they said we're asking for X amount of uh, money X amount of dollars and you have X amount of time to give, bring, bring it to us and if you contact the authorities you'll never hear from your son again and this is this extortion method was used uh, commonly in, uh, in South America not only in Argentina and other countries as well and not exclusively only to Jews but Jews were known to pay for their children. Okay. It happened to be that somebody from the family did contact the authorities. And immediately they lost contact with the kidnappers and they weren't able to make contact for over a week. The father was so distraught, he got on a plane, went to Israel. He went to the rabbis that he usually met with and he's like, rabbis, I need help, I need help. I don't know where my son is. So they say, you know what, let's go to the Baba Sali. They went to the Baba Sali, they told him the story. He told them for something like this, you go to my grandson, go to Baba Mary. He says, he, he can help you. They went to Baba Mary, they told him of the story. And he told him, okay, sit down. And they report that he took out a Gemara and he just started to learn. For 10 minutes, he was like this, rubbing his head, learning, learning, learning. And then he asked him for a napkin and a, and, a, and a pencil. And he started to sketch out lines like a street and then a building. And he started to write down. He says, okay, write down. Your son is in England. He's on this street in this building. This is the address and this is the apartment number. Go now. The, the father didn't know what to do. They immediately called Scotland Yard. They called Scotland Yard. They gave the address. They explained to him the story. The government called and the, whatever they set it up. An hour later, they had the son. 
He flew out to England. He picked up his son, flew back to Israel, came to Baba Meir, and he told him, you ever went to England? How do you know the name of the street? How do you know the building? How do you know this? Come back to our lesson. Oh, the news. That you're able to see from one place of the earth to the other side. Hashem reserved it for who? For the tzaddikim. The rabbi just looked into the Torah and he was able to access this light, this organuz. This organuz that we're able to find not only in the Torah, but in the Hanukkah candles and in the future. And there's a, a select few in the world that know how to access it here. Look what is inside Hanukkah. Look what is inside this holiday. So to summarize, what did we learn? A lot of our salvations that we've experienced throughout Jewish history was because our forefathers went through that trial, passed it, and planted a seed, embedded in our DNA the ability to pass that test. Today we zoned in on one example of that. How Yosef's trial with Eshet Potiphar was the, 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 the saving grace for the Jewish people in Mitzrayim, in Yavan, and were able to withstand the advances of the Egyptian people and the advances of the, uh, of the Yavanim who wanted to darken our world, Choshe, from Yosef at Sadiq. And we see also that there's a, a time right now because Yosef helped us in Hanukkah, and he represents the protection of the Yesod, that during this time it's good to increase what? Shmirat Enayim. It's good to increase Sniut. And it's good to increase Torah learning. Because Torah learning, as we learn today, has the power to increase peace in the world. And there's no better type of Torah learning than Torah Chesed. What is the Torah Chesed? The Torah that you teach to other people. And that gives Hashem the biggest honor there could be. And by that you're able to increase the, the, the light in the world. What's light? Torah. So when we stop right now and say, okay, great lesson. I love it. I'm, I don't want to forget a thing. How do I live out this lesson? It's very easy. You go out into the, into the world and you see how messed up it is right now. How everything's upside down. How everything is so in darkness. How people are in spiritual darkness. How they're enveloped by the physical and completely shying away from the spiritual. They say, oh, I get it. There's darkness. I must increase the light. How does a Jew increase light in the world? Simple. Learn Torah. You want to increase the light even more so? Teach the Torah. And if you can't learn Torah or teach the Torah, support Torah. Support a, a Torah institution where all they do is learn. You have a share in that. Like for example, Rabbi Sa'ala Bridger in the yeshiva of Rav Yorah Michaela Bridger, which is the Amir Laaretz. I mean, you give a dollar to that institution, that dollar gets separated into what? A thousand of Rechim, into Mikveh, into supporting orphans, supporting widows, into uh, uh, giving food during the holidays to the poor, to publicizing Torah all over the world. What? That increases, that increases the, the, the honor of Hashem all the way. Why? Because even if you can't do, you, get, you can get connected to ones that do on a wholesale level. It's not like it used to be before. You can just support your local synagogue. You can literally get connected to what? To mega organizations that are, you know, the, the, the speedometer, the, the odometer, right? Like the mitzvot are like... Thousand mitzvot a minute, fifteen. You know, at the end of the day, you're at like a hundred thousand mitzvot, and you have your share of it. You put your, uh, your, your, your little string connected to all that. It's always good to crystallize what our focus is in our life and what's important for us as Jews, and to be able to get connected to winning life, to winning life, to winning the Jewish life. Now, when Mashiach comes, he opens up the red velvet rope and says, "Yes, you." You're part of the Geulah. And by the way, all the people that you've merited also along the way, you and you and you, yeah, 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 she took care of it, come. The worst thing during the time of the Geulah is Chas Shalom when Eliyahu Navi is holding that red velvet rope, and what? Oh, is that my brother? 
that my sister? Is that my aunt? Is that my uncle? Is that my mom? Is that my father? They didn't make it to the Geula? Is that my cousin? Is that my best friend? How's your heart going to feel when they don't merit to the Geula? Chas v'shalom. That's why it's good for us to increase Torah in the world to the people that are closest to us. Family. After that, friends. After that, people in the community. After that, anybody else that you can touch. The Torah is good for everybody, Jews and Gentiles. It's good to be spiritual in a world that is engulfed by physicality. Shashem barech otchem, sameach otchem, chag sameach, and bezat Hashem, we see that ma'asavot siman abanim is something that strengthens us, that it's good for us to pass the test because of our children in the future.